beautiful are the trees. This is all, now this is fall. This is fall, and I love it. I'm here for it, and I'm thankful that y'all are here. We're going to ask the Lord's blessing on our service, and then we will keep singing. How's that sound? Yes. I'm going to ask the returning Brother George Brenneman. So good to have you guys back. Church is not the same without the Brenneman family. Amen? Amen. Brother Brenneman, ask the Lord to bless our service, please, sir. Amen. All right, grab those blue hymn books now. We're going to turn to page number 539, page number 539. How many of you getting a little nervous that the pastor wasn't going to show up? <laughs> oh, it was just me? Okay, well, that's fair. <laughs> Let's take a moment and greet with one another.
right, as we make our way back to our seats, 539, we'll sing out on that last verse. Rescue the perishing, duty demanded, strength for thy labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently with him, till the poor wanderer a Savior has died. Rescue the perishing, for the dying, Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save on that chorus. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Wonderful stalling method, Brother Ryan. Thank you, sir. Amen. Let's have our ushers come up and we'll receive the offering. I pray that you'll be faithful to give as the Lord uh, has prospered you. And if you have looked on our bulletin, you see what I'm going to be talking about. And I don't think it'll hurt as much if you put something in the offering plate this morning. Amen. So let's give as the Lord has blessed us, all right? And I'm going to ask Brother Tony Broerman, if you would, please ask God to bless our offering. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the pastor. We thank you for Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. Lord, I pray for the offering that they promised today and the preacher. I pray for Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. playing for us, Brother Ryan, for leading us in song. Grateful for my ushers and grateful for my sound boothers. Thank you, guys. I do have a gift up here. It says, to me, from S-A-S. Reveal yourself. <laughs> Who is S-A-S? I don't know what that means. Oh, Oprah, okay. I'm just saying, I don't know who it is. Okay. <laughs> All right. It's a... It's a <laughs> It looks to be a snack, a Bigfoot-themed snack. But I don't know if that's quite church-appropriate, whoever gave that to me. So after church, I'll let you come up and look at it. But uh, anyway, apologies to our live stream audience. You can't see what this is. Everyone else can after the service. But anyway, nothing says church like what I'm looking at right now. So nothing says this church like what I'm looking at right now. So. Let me give you some announcements. Uh, don't forget, in junior church is Pumpkin Sunday, so every child in junior church is going to have a pumpkin to take home. So please, parents, don't be alarmed when they do have a small pumpkin taken home. They did not steal it. They were allowed to have it, okay? This Wednesday is the Children's Christmas Program practice down in the Fellowship Hall, 7 p.m. If you have any questions, please see Miss Ann about that. That's Wednesday. We will have regular midweek service as well, but the children are practicing for the Christmas program. A week from today in the evening service is our fifth Sunday Spectacular, and in the evening we're going to let the teenagers take over. This is our teen takeover night. So uh, Brother Dylan Burkhart will be moderating the service, and the teenagers will be serving and singing and preaching and getting involved. Are you thankful for that? Amen. I'm thankful for teenagers. I'm thankful for a youth group that desires to do that. Amen. So what a blessing. So we'll be praying for you teenagers, and thank you all for serving. I really mean that. Thank you for serving the Lord. We're excited, and we're behind you, aren't we? We're behind you, all right? We love our youth group, and we're thankful for you. Now, two weeks from today is the big one. That is our 50th anniversary Sunday. That is why all the stuff on the back, you'll see old pictures and some memorabilia stuff. Let me encourage you, if you have anything to contribute, please bring it. Put it on the table. You know, Don't push anything else off to make room, but please bring stuff like that. Um, it has been a, a long process trying to assemble that, and uh, I appreciate 
uh, several of y'all sending me pictures, and we're trying to trying to just have some old memories, and I'm very thankful for the past. I'm very thankful for goodly heritage, but I'm also excited about the future. And I think our 50th anniversary Sunday can serve as both a sweet reminder of God's blessings in the past, but also a springboard into an exciting future. I happen to think God's not done with us. I happen to think God still wants to do something special with our church. But we've had some good times over the years. It was really good before I got here. After that, it kind of slowly started. <laughs> but you can see some of those sweet memories in the back. You take a look, all right? You try to uh, find yourself if you were here back then. And if not, draw, draw yourself in one of the pictures. That would be okay. But if you have old pictures like that, please feel free to bring some, okay? A lot of good memories back there, a lot of fun stuff. And also a lot of pictures where you're going, what in the world? And it's one of those things, you just had to be there. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff our church has seen where you just had to be there. But anyway, I'm very grateful for our rich heritage and uh, really excited about that day. We have several former members coming who have uh, since been out of town, and they're coming back in town for that. Excited to have the Warrens here. Excited to have several of our former pastors here. Excited to have Mrs. Criswell here. So let me encourage you that if you are friends with people who used to attend here, they don't anymore, just reach out to them. Say, we'd love to have them for the 50th anniversary. And let me encourage you, and I'll be tactful how I say this, so read between the lines. That is a day of celebration. That is not a day of rehashing possibly some old disagreements. This is a day of celebration. So please leave any ill will outside. Don't bring it in here because I'm just uh, – I guess, irritable enough to shut it down if I see it not bringing glory to Jesus, to whom all glory is deserved. So that's going to be a happy day, a day with laughter, a day with hugging necks and rejoicing and praising the Lord like we do, and that's it. So I'll say, I'll say more about that maybe tonight, but please let me encourage you. In fact, let me say this. That might be a good day to bury some hatchets. Amen? So let me encourage you. Welcome some people back. Let's, let, let's just enjoy what the Lord has done. 50 years. Brother Adams, 50 years for any church in this day and age, that is a blessing. Amen. I mean, Brother Adams has, is out preaching at churches trying to help keep them going. Uh, I mean, what a blessing it is. 50 years. We, we should not take that for granted. We cannot live in the past. But, oh, let's enjoy the past, be thankful for it, but get excited about what's to come. I'm excited. I think God's going to do some special things. So you see everything going on there in your bulletin. We have a fellowship meal after the morning service. We'll have a testimonial afternoon service where we can share some stories and memories, and that'll just be a good time of fellowship. You check out the bulletin there. There will uh, be some additional special things we have that day. Uh, we will have a, a banner where you can have a photo opportunity in front of it. I tried to get real professional if you hadn't noticed, so someone commend me, please. Uh, but And we also have a, a gift I'd like to give away to each family. Just some special things. That's going to be a fun day. So I hope you will be here. Don't forget everything else there in your bulletin. Election day is coming up. Please pray and vote, okay? Pray and vote. Uh, the 11th, Friday the 11th, is our progressive dinner. Teenagers, progressive dinner activity. Also, Veterans Sunday the 13th, I do have a special gift I'd like to give every uh, current and former military personnel. Okay, I'd like to bless you since you have been such a blessing to us. Uh, final thing, I think final thing I have to say is there is a ladies activity coming up uh, at Landmark Baptist in Evansville. It's called a ladies refresher, and the theme is She Found Favor. And there's a couple of guest speakers here. That's going to be at Landmark Baptist on Saturday, November 12th from 10 to 2. The cost is $15 a person. If you plan to go, you can reach out to uh, Miss Wendy Robinson, uh, the pastor's wife there. You can let my wife know she plans to attend. That is the, the Saturday, the 12th from 10 to 2. Cost is $15. And uh, ladies, you are sure to be encouraged. And, uh, oh, man, they have a menu on the back. I didn't know that. <laughs> They are Baptists. That's right. Well, I mean, this is like their invitation card. They're like, we really want some Baptists to come, so let's throw in the menu. Because you got, you got some people like, I don't know, food, you know, and like, they're going to be food, you know, so they'll be there. But amen. All right. Well, that's, I believe that is all the announcements that I have. Please be praying for the 50th anniversary. Like I said, a lot of people traveling distances pray for safety and just pray that the Lord be exalted in everything we do, okay? That's all that I have for you. Uh, choir practice tonight. Choir practice at 4.30. We'll continue the Book of Jonah series at 6. But for now, let's sing a few more songs this morning. Let's all stand, take your blue hymnal, 
And let's go to 383, please. Page 383. And let's sing out, My Anchor Holds. Does it hold? Amen. Are you thankful for an anchor that is steadfast and sure in the storms of life? Next Sunday morning, I'll be preaching about Jesus, how he is a shelter in the time of storm. Until then, let's sing, My Anchor Holds, 383. that I have an anchor in Christ Jesus. We can go over to 393 now, 393, and sing about that blessed assurance that I have in him. Jesus is mine, amen. 393.
you can, please remain standing for the reading of God's word. Please take your Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter number 9, please. 2 Corinthians, chapter number 9. SAS stands for Sasquatch, doesn't it? I just put that together. I was hoping whoever you are would reveal yourself. Someone say, there you go. But uh, yeah, you can come take a look at that after the service. So 2 Corinthians chapter 9, please. 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. And uh, I told Brother Broerman, and uh, I mentioned this to some of my family at our bonfire yesterday in Kentucky, and that's why they're here. I went about guilting every one of them, saying, I'll be in church. And they went... So like, like ducklings just came in here like this, like, oh man, that's what happens when Joey comes to town. But no, I'm glad you guys are here. And uh, Uncle Dana, I think it was you, I was saying, I'm on a roll. Last Sunday, I preached on patience, and it went over about as well as you can imagine. And today, I'm going to preach on giving, and I think it's going to go about as well as I can imagine. <laughs> but how many of y'all know that this principle is in Scripture? Amen. So we're going to see a little bit about giving. You probably will not be swinging from the chandeliers today. But I hope that you will take these truths and apply it to you, and we will see that God truly can bless us in accordance to how we bless him. So let's look. 2 Corinthians 9, look in verse 6 through 15. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 through 15 says this, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness." being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. Whilst by the experiment of this ministration they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ, and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. And by their prayer for you, which long after you for their exceeding grace of God in you. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. So we see several mentions of thanksgiving, realizing that giving is a part of that word, thanksgiving. And that principle is there. So let's pray, and then we'll jump into this. Lord, you sure are good to us. Lord, you've spoiled us. Thank you for loving us in spite of us. Lord, thank you for the folks who are here. Thank you for giving us safety and health to be here. Lord, I pray that you'd please be with those who could not be with us today for whatever purpose. But Lord, for those who are here, we desire to hear from you. And Lord, as we talked about in Sunday school, I would never embark on a sermon like this without you, without your leading. And Lord, I desperately need your empowering and your guiding through the course of this message. Holy Spirit of God, dealing with something like money, we tend to bristle up. We tend not to want to hear it. Holy Spirit, I pray your supernatural power upon this congregation that you would please deal with our hearts. Help us to be receptive of what the Bible teaches about giving. Lord, I pray that we would make decisions that would bring you honor and glory. Please help us now. We'll praise you and thank you for all that is said and done. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I do thank you for standing. treasurer sit down <laughs> it, it, that's that's his default setting you're kind of proving the point I'm getting ready to make money gets our attention doesn't it doesn't it I mean good night brother Ryan just fast I've seen him moving a long time fried chicken at the potluck and money up here my soul You can't have this, though. This is perhaps our lunch money. My wife said if I preach good, she might get Stromboli's from Pizza King. So needless to say, I will not be having Stromboli's from Pizza King. But uh, anyway, it's a nice, it gives me hope. It gives me hope. You know, 
you probably looked at the bulletin and you're thinking, oh, here he goes, preacher going to talk about money. What I have found is a lot of people don't like when you talk about money because what you're doing is rattling their cage and ruffling their feathers. Money is a god to a lot of us. What I have found in the years of pastoring and just being here before I pastored is most people in this church are actually like, you ought to preach on it more. Now, why would you say that? Because the Bible actually says a whole lot about our treasure, about where we invest these things, about giving, about being liberal, about being generous with these things. So in fact, in this church, I can say, as God is my witness, I've had more people say, you ought to preach more about it. But you don't understand how, I'll just say it, scary it is sometimes to tell a bunch of Baptists you ought to be giving your money to the Lord because they're like, why? And it's like, well, we're going to look at Scripture to tell you why. Um, in fact, some people have gone as, they've been as so bold to say, when you refuse to preach on giving, you're robbing us of a, being a blessing. And I thought, well, I mean, come on. If you're wanting to word it that way, Johnny Christian, okay, fine. <laughs> but you know what? They're kind of right. What we've seen here and what we'll see, Lord willing, through the course of this message is that giving can also bring blessings upon us. When Paul was commending the church at Philippi for their financial giving, listen to these statements he makes. This is Philippians 4, verse 17 through 19. Not because I desire a gift. He say, I'm not wanting you to give because I want something. It's not for me. But I desire fruit that may abound to your account. He's saying, I want you to give to something that matters in light of eternity. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So what Paul is saying in that particular passage is, I am not after personal increase. How many times have y'all heard me say, when I do talk about money, it's not like I go down after the service and I get a handful of the take. That's not how this works. I don't even see what comes in, all right? We have people in place, the ushers, and then our, our secretary, Miss Laura, and then Brother Ryan as the treasurer. I don't even have to deal with money, and I kind of like that, by the way, because otherwise I'd see who's not given, and I'd set the pulpit right in front of you and preach this message, <laughs> and that wouldn't be received well. That wouldn't be in the right spirit. So, yes, I purposely take precautions so I don't see that, and it, again, it's not like preacher gets a take of it. He does not. So what Paul is saying is I'm not after something for me. I'm after for the resources for the gospel's sake. I'm after the resources so this church can continue. I'm after the resources so those missionaries can keep going and doing what they're doing. Paul is saying that the work of the Lord costs money. It just does. Everything costs money, and money is a necessary tool. Now, the love of money, we know, is the root of all evil. But money itself is a tool. And by the way, a lot of people, there's always someone who wants to say when the pastor talks about money, well, pastor, money is the root of all evil. No, the love of money is the root of all evil. And I tell you, and if that's the case, give me your money. I'll deliver you from evil. Come on, right here. <laughs> You've heard someone say that, haven't you? Money is the root of all evil? No, that's not what the scripture teaches. Money just seems to get our attention, and we know it is a necessity. Okay? And you say, God doesn't need my money. No, but you need God's blessings. So we need to read the scripture in accordance to what the book says. And I believe I've showed you from that text, and we'll keep going, that one surefire way to get God's blessings is to give, to give generously, and to give faithfully. As I started with the illustration, money just seems to get our attention, right? If I say the word inflation, you don't think of a birthday party with balloons, do you? Your frowns are revealing that, no, that's not what you're thinking about. You think of inflation or gas prices, right? My soul. Our local Facebook page in Newburgh, I took a picture of Huck's gas station. It was like 219, and I posted on the Newburgh page, and, and the news, the uh, 14 News or whatever, they messaged me and said, can we use this picture for news? And I'm like, sure, because gas prices, right? It gets our attention. Like, we want to see what's going on with it. It's like, whoa, that's low. And you talk about taxes and sales going on, and really anything that has to do with money and spending, it just gets our attention, all right? And just as God has a way that he wants us to do everything, God has a way that he wants us to govern our money. He has a way that he wants us to govern our finances, okay? And I happen to think life just seems to be more enjoyable when you honor God with your money. When you let God's principles govern how you spend your money, what you do with your money, it just seems to make life more enjoyable. And uh, after all, it's God's anyway. The Bible says in Haggai 2.8, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. And again, if you don't like that statement, you're in for a long morning. 
Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. So we are stewards of God's blessings. What he has given to us, you and I are supposed to use it in the most responsible way that would bring him the most glory. You know, if I, uh, if I gave you the keys to Marvin out there, you say, who in the world's Marvin? That's my truck. <laughs> Who'd you think it was? Of course he has a name. And he has feelings, too, so quit judging. <laughs> if I were to throw you the keys to Marvin, so there you go, take it for a spin, you can't just run it like it's yours, right? Drive it like you stole it. No, because it's not yours. But I'm allowing you to use it for whatever purpose. You say, I need to do this. I, need to, I got some errands to run. Okay, here's the keys to Marvin. It's not yours, but you are the steward of it. And you need to take care of it like it is yours, maybe even a little bit more than you would. Right? If you stay at, at uh, if you go to a hotel, you're supposed to take care of it like it's yours, even though it is not. You're simply paying for a room. Or you're renting something, or you're borrowing something. You're supposed to take care of it like it's yours, though it's not. You're a steward of what has been given to you. That's how God is with this. He owns everything, so therefore everything that we have, we are stewards of it for His cause. So this begs the question, how are we using what God has given to us? Anything, whether it is money or our time, our schedule, our talents, how are we using these things to bring honor to Jesus Christ? This morning, I want us to understand we are the stewards of also the financial blessings that God has allowed into our lives. And basic financial principles from scriptures will help us manage God's money properly. And it will make your lives less complicated, and it will make your lives more pleasing to the Lord. And I would think we all desire to please our Heavenly Father, right? I don't think if I said, who, who wants to please God? I don't think there's anyone like, I don't care. You, that might be the last thing you ever do. I, I don't recommend that type of attitude. But remember this truth. God is the source of everything you have. Everything. Right. Everything you got. James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. If you have been increased or prospered in any way, you need to thank God for that. We need to give thanks, as the Bible said twice, just in those verses we read. Thanksgiving, offering him thanks. Now, someone may be thinking, well, God didn't build my business. I built my business. God didn't go to school for me. I went to school. God doesn't manage my employees. I do. God didn't allow this stuff. I did it. Well, you would err in thinking that way. I want you to go to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Go ahead and hold your spot in 2 Corinthians 9, but let's go to Deuteronomy 8 toward the front of your Bible. Deuteronomy chapter number 8. Y'all still hanging in there with me? Good, because we have, we've only just begun. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 8. You see, there's always this mentality of people saying, well, I did that, right? I, I saved up for my car, and I built my business, and I did that, and I did that. And people will fall into that mentality. It's dangerous, but unfortunately, it's kind of the norm. But you see, Moses dealt with that in his day as well, and there's some very wise instruction he gives that we can apply to our lives as well. Look at, uh, look at this, this trap he's trying to help them avoid, this way of thinking. Look in Deuteronomy 8, beginning in verse 11. Deuteronomy chapter 8, beginning in verse 11. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God, in not keeping his commandments, and his judgments, and his statutes, which I commanded thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full, and hast built goodly houses, and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied. So he's saying when you've been successful, and you've gotten some money, and you've gotten some clout, and you've gotten some acclamation, and all of a sudden things are starting to gel, and life's going good. Look in verse 14. Then thine heart be lifted up. And thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. He's saying, don't forget who's buttered your bread. Don't forget who's given you this blessing. Don't forget who has allowed us to learn these things and gain that way. And so in this case, he's saying, don't forget who delivered us out of bondage in Egypt. Don't forget who gave us this freedom. Verse 15, who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee and that he might prove thee, to do thee good at thy latter end. And now say in thine heart, my power and the might of my hand shall be got, or shall, or I'm sorry, hath gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, 
that he may establish his covenant, which he is swear unto thy fathers, as it is this day. And it shall be, if thou at all forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, and serve them, and worship them, I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. As the nations which the Lord destroyeth before your face, so shall ye perish, because you would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. So again, it's just the principle that applies to us now. You and I need to have a nice, healthy dose of thanksgiving and gratitude for what the Lord has allowed us to have. I mean, have you ever seen a wreck on the, on the highway and you start to complain that, man, this is making me late, but then you stop and you praise God that you weren't in that wreck? It could have been, your day could have been so much worse. You ever had a health issue that thankfully was taken care of and didn't escalate to become very, very bad? Praise God. You understand is we all have a reason to be thankful and everything we do, including the very ability and knowledge to build wealth, that's a gift from the Heavenly Father. And we would do well to remember that. And that's kind of the principle there. Now, we need to understand that we are commanded to give, okay? It is not a recommendation. We are commanded to give. And if you have been increased in any way, whether it is money or time or influence, things like that, you owe God some of that. You owe God a portion of what he has prospered you with. Listen to what Paul said in Acts 20, 35. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than receive. Jesus said in Luke 6, 38, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over. Shall men give into your bosom? For the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. So this idea here is that as we give, we receive back in accordance to what we have given. You understand? That what we get, it is in direct correlation of what we choose to give. But we not only receive it back, we get more. That's a pretty good deal. I mean, I'm not the sharpest knife in the place where they keep the knives. But that's a pretty good deal. Where God says, if you give, I'll give you more. I want you to picture uh, letting someone borrow a, a coffee can full of beans. Do we do that anymore? Do we borrow beans? We're going to do it today for the illustration's sake. So imagine you say, sure, here's a coffee can full of beans. It's yours. You can use it. And when they return it to you, they have put even more than what they took out. And they, they packed it down to get more. And they pressed it down. Even when they give it to you, it's spilling over because they've given you more than what you have given them. That's the thought here. That Jesus, whatever you give to him, he's going to give it back to you. But man, he's compacted it. He's pressed it down. He shook it together, kept compacting it to give you more than what you've given him. That's a Bible promise, church. That's not me. That's what Jesus said. This is truth. This is principle here. When you give unto the Lord, you will, get what was, you will get more than what was given. That's a pretty good deal. One thing my dad taught me was when you borrow something from someone, whether it's their car or their home, you stay in their home, you return it in better shape than what you found it. And so we've always tried to live by that. Uh, the borrowed car is going to be gassed up. It'll be cleaned. Uh, the home will be cleaned thoroughly, right? The bed sheets washed and the floors mopped. And on some occasions, steaks left in the freezer. He's done that a time or two. Stayed at people's houses and he left steaks in their freezer. So, right? You, that, not my imagination. Okay. Actually, I do remember that because I took it when you weren't looking. So. <laughs> but it's the same principle. When you choose to give to the Lord, he takes care of you. He gives back to you and then some. It really is a test of faith. Like, do I really believe Jesus is going to do what he said he's going to do? Do, do, I, do I believe that Jesus has the power to give me more than what I've given him to the point I will actually obey and give? It's a test of faith. And by the way, how many of y'all know that without faith it is impossible to please God? We talk about faith a lot till it comes to our finances. Then we're like, yeah, it just becomes a little sketchy there. Now, there are a few ways specifically we can give mentioned in Scripture. The first one is talking about tithing. How many of y'all have heard that word before? Am I the only one that kind of hurts to say it? Tithing sometimes. There's just a little bit of conviction that comes with that. The root word is tithe, and it means tenth. It means 10%. When the Lord increases or prospers us, we're to give back that first 10% of that income. Okay? To be an honest tither, one only needs obedience and basic math skills. I have the obedience, and I have a calculator. I don't have basic math skills, but praise God, I have a calculator. 1 Corinthians 16, 2 says, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him. 
Proverbs 3, 9 and 10, Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the firstfruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Deuteronomy 26, 10 emphasizes that what is given to the Lord ought to be the firstfruits, all right, not the leftovers. Uh, in the Old Testament, the Jews would give 10% of all that they were increased with before anything else was taken out. So before taxes, before those deductions and the groceries and the bills, the utilities, all that, you ought to pay the Lord what you owe him. He ought to be first in your life. He ought to be number one priority. That's one reason that I write my tithe check out before I've even seen the bills. Because you all pray for me. But sometimes when you see the bills there, it intimidates you to write that tithe check. Don't look at me like that. But that's a reason that when I get paid, it's a set day every other week, I get paid and I write that, that tithe check, give a little to uh, offering, give some to missions, and, I, and then that's when I deal with everything else. And guess what? The Lord has just been very, very good to me. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, I was given some very expensive shoes from the church. I'm wearing them. They're awesome. Thank you. So anyway, I'm just saying it is a blessing. I, 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 I could not have afforded those shoes, and praise God, he just chose to bless me with that, and I'm thankful for that. I truly believe that one reason the Lord just takes care of little things like that is because I've chose to honor him first with my money. Let's go to Malachi chapter 3, if you will, please. Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, uh, it's in the Old Testament. It is right before the New Testament. So if you come to Matthew, you've gone too far. So Malachi, right before the book of Matthew, and we'll see, this is probably the principal text regarding tithing, but I don't just want to focus on that. There are a few things I want to take from that, and I think it'll be a blessing to you. You may not like it, kind of like medicine. It tastes bad going in, but I promise you it'll make you feel better. Oh, I strongly think it'll make you feel better. Malachi chapter 3, beginning in verse 6. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. Malachi 3, 6, this is what it says. Are you there? All right, Malachi 3, verse 6, it says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances, and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delight." Some land, a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. So I want to break these verses down. Keep your Bibles open. Keep your eyes fixed right there. Verse 6 tells us that God doesn't change. Therefore, if he said it before, he still believes it. If it's still in the Word of God, it still applies to today. Okay? The book's not out of date, old-fashioned, needs to be replaced. It's still the book. It's still the Word of God, and it's still powerful, and it's still alive, and I'm still so grateful for it. It's still the Word of God. So culture, times, philosophies should not matter when they're in comparison with the Word of God. The Word of God is timeless. Verse 8 and 9 gives the idea that when we don't tithe, we are robbing God of what is His. Now, do you know the difference between stealing and robbing? Stealing is done in secret. Okay, Stealing is something you do when no one's looking. Right? I... Okay, making sure I had that the $20 bill, Brother Ryan. Because, I mean, he's a sneaky he's a sneaky guy, you know. So stealing would be when I'm over here just preaching up a storm because this is the bunch that needs the preaching the most right here. And I'm over here preaching, and he sneaks up here, and he takes that. And, of course, everyone would see, but, you know, I wouldn't see, so we'd leave. He stole that from me because I'm like, where'd it go? What happened? That's stealing. It was in secret. Robbing is point blank. Give me your money. All right. It, it, picture a, a robber going into a grocery store, gun to his chest saying, give me all the money that's in the register. That's robbing. Taking something where they see who it is and what you're doing and why you're doing it. What I'm saying is God doesn't look at what should come in and be like, what? Where, where'd it go? I, I, I misplaced some. No, the Bible says we're robbing God. As in he's like, what are you doing? That's, that's mine. <laughs> that's rightfully mine. I'm letting you keep 90%, don't you? I mean, 10 is more than fair. 
And the Bible goes on to say that if we don't heed that, then all of a sudden there's a curse that falls on us. I don't, don't like curses and just want to kind of stay away from that. But you think of the truths from the poor widow woman and the two mites in Luke 21. You don't have to turn there. But Jesus tells the disciples that the widow cast everything in, but the others around only cast in of their abundance. That means they had money to spare, so they gave it in there. But the, the poor widow woman, she gave literally everything she had. So what we see here is that God knows exactly what we should be giving, what we're actually giving. He sees what goes in, but he also sees what we withhold. He sees what we're holding on to. He sees what we give, and he sees what we don't give. Malachi 3, verse 10 and 12 then goes on to prove how blessed the person is who does as he ought to. Look at this. The Bible says the windows of heaven are open, and that blessings are poured, about, uh, poured out upon you so much that you can't contain them all. And he says the devourer is rebuked, as in God divinely kind of protects the, the assets and the things and the property. Like, you ever, you ever have a washer and dryer that you're like, this thing should have died 30 years ago, but it's still clunking, still going, right? Or shoes that should have wore out or clothes that should have wore out, and you're just like, how, are you guys, how is this still working? The Bible says God rebukes the devourer and seems to just make it last. You ever been so tight financially and somehow that dollar bill stretches and it gets you to payday and you're like, how did we do that? God can rebuke the devourer. As we honor him, it seems like he just has his hand of protection and blessings upon it where you're like, I don't know how this old clunker of a car keeps working, but somehow it's working. That doesn't mean we won't always have unforeseen costs and bills, but it does mean that he's not going to give us anything we cannot handle. We just need to trust God, guys. And that includes with our money. Money talks, doesn't it? I knew it would be pretty quiet today. That's all right. Now, listen to what this says here. Deuteronomy 14, 22 and 23. Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed, that the field bringeth forth year by year. So what this kind of points to the fact is, is we give, all of a sudden more is given back to us. We've seen that principle repeated. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn of thy wine, of thine oil, and the firstlings of thy herds and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. And then there are some who will try to justify their unwillingness to tithe. They'll say, well, that was Old Testament law, and, and through Jesus it's been abolished. Well, I would encourage that crowd to kindly study up on the priest Melchizedek. And uh, we won't have time to go there, but just write this down. Abraham paid him tithes on all that he possessed. And Melchizedek is an Old Testament picture of Jesus as the great high priest. And Abraham knew to give him 10% of all that he had. And that was before the law was even given and before it was put into effect. So basically the common sense is we owe God something even before the law told us. There's just a, there's a feeling that I owe my creator something. He's been good to me. I owe him something. Hebrews 7, verse 1 through 4. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. Saying that really no one is too good to give back to God. No one is too good to give back to God. So the first tenth of the increase of the tithe. It means if you've been prospered something, 10% of that ought to go right back to God. That's commanded of God. And then there's the offering part. Now offerings are above the tithe. But this is where you get the blessing and the opportunity to be generous. This is where you get to seek the Lord. This is where you get to pray about what you want to give and where you want to give it. Okay? The word offering can be found over 630 times in your scriptures. And an offering is what we give unto the Lord to show what he means to us. The tithe is commanded. As in, that shouldn't be up for debate. That, we don't even talk about the tithe. That should just be known. The offering... That's where we can demonstrate through our giving how much faith is there, how much love is there, what our burdens are, what we desire to see. Okay? It is a sacrifice on our part, by the way. And I believe it's the heart of the matter that God looks at. Now, money is certainly not the only way we can give offering unto the Lord, but it is definitely a way. And I do pray that you are partaking in the offering, not just the tithing, but the offering. Say, what should I give to? Well, I can give you some ideas, but I'd really rather you seek the Lord's face and say, what shall I give to? 
missions, I think that's a great <laughs> investment. Our local outreach, I think that's a great investment. Uh, there's all kinds of, of items, and we can get to that later, but the offering is between you and the Lord. It's after the tithe, and it's like, Lord, this is what I can give, this is what I want to give, and this is where I want to give it, okay? And there are many areas to give as an offering, and you just pray about that, and you seek the Lord about that. I believe he's worth it. I believe he's worth every sacrifice. And number three, last one, almsgiving, almsgiving. Now, people have asked me, what is alms? And I don't know if this is like the super correct way of saying it, but what I have said is when you give to someone or something, but it's under the Lord and there's no paper trail. What does that mean? That means there's no evidence. That means you can't just kind of, you know, give someone something and kind of look around, make sure everyone's looking, take a selfie. Don't do that. If you give to someone who's homeless out there, don't take a selfie. You, you've told, I mean, that's just, I think I've gotten on that hobby horse before. Can I get an amen on that? If you're, I mean, that's great if you're going to give to someone who's less fortunate, but please don't make it about you, okay? That's just, that's just, that's, uh, let me just move on. But anyway, I think it ought to stop. But almsgiving is when you give to a person or a cause and there's no expectation back. You're hoping it remains anonymous. You do not do it for attention. You don't want people looking at you. You truly do it to just be a blessing to that individual, okay? You don't want credit for alms. That is something between you and Jesus, and that's it. And, and potentially the person you gave it to, but hopefully by then there's enough common sense where they don't make a big to-do about it. They just say thank you. They humbly accept it, and they move on. Alms is truly something strictly between you and the Lord that he can use to help someone else or a purpose. And you're saying, God, I'm giving this, unto, or giving this to them, but it is unto you. Flip over to Matthew 6 really quick. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. This is just a few pages over from where you were in Malachi. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. These are the words of Jesus Christ. How many of y'all think we ought to pay attention to what Jesus tells us? There's a lot of talking heads out there, aren't there? A lot of politicians and sports an, uh, analysts and uh, news analysts, and it's fine if you got the ones you listen to. I got the ones I listen to, but I think above all, what does Jesus say? Look what he says in Matthew 6, 1. Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. What does that mean? That means if you go out of your way to bless someone else and give them money, if you're making a show where you want people to see you, there you go, there's your reward, you're even. Was it worth it? Me, I would rather do something in secret and then anticipate God to follow through with what he said he'll do and bless me and openly. He, what we, well, let's keep reading. I don't want to misquote it. Look what it says in verse 2. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as in don't make a big show, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have the reward. It means they're square. You, you got people's attention. There you go. That, that's your payment. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. That means keep it secret. That thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. Now, I love you guys, but I happen to think that God could bless me a whole lot better than you could. You were just very good to me a few weeks ago, and I'm grateful for that. But how many of y'all think that God might have a bigger treasure chest to pull from than any of us? Would you agree with that? So my advice to you is when the Lord lays upon your heart to give alms, to be a blessing to someone, don't draw attention to yourself. Because if you do, you're robbing yourself of a blessing because God's like, I can really reward you. Oh, you wanted 10 seconds of applause? There you go. And it's done. I would rather have God's blessing upon me than any other person. And that's not disrespectful to any people. That's just a testament to how good God is and what he could do for us. So when you give alms, you're blessing someone else while telling the Lord, Lord, this is unto you. And you are anticipating, you know, something from him. That's what the scripture says. That's the promise right there. And when we have missionaries come in, I encourage you to give them the green handshake. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? The green, when, I, when we have a missionary come in and they're trying to raise money and they're on deputation, I'll say, hey, if, if the Lord's blessed to be able to, why don't you give them the green handshake? I say, what does that mean? Well, we can practice after the service. I'll tell you how to do it. You put a hundred in your hand or anything and you shake the missionary's hand and you encourage them to keep it. You just kind of give them a knowing smile. Usually they've done enough. They'll humbly take it and they'll say, thank you very much. And that's it. You don't say, oh, I just wanted to be a blessing. Just wanted to bless um, God's man, missionary. You know, I, I didn't really need that 50, so I just figured I'd, you know, humbly bless you, missionary. 
It's not how it's supposed to be. And again, Scripture teaches if that's what you do, you're square. And by the way, that missionary is going to think you're very odd. So, I mean, just take that with you. I mean, and by the way, we can do an anonymous letter with a gift card, with a word of encouragement. I think that goes a long way. A random act of kindness took some time to do it, but no evidence, right? No note that says this was done by me. Just something unto the Lord. Almsgiving. God's, God blesses that. So there are three facets to giving, tithing, offering, and alms. And in case you've been nodding off this whole time, I'll kind of illustrate what it is. So um, let's see. Landon, would you hire me? Would you hire me for something? You don't know. Would you hire me? Sure. I am hurt. I mean, like, they're all like, I don't think he's pretty shady. You'd hire me? No. Okay, what would you hire me to do? Pretty good at cutting grass. Just, just saying. No, he's like, no. He hires me for something, okay? And he pays me $10. So I got $10 here. So after everything, this, is, this was our, our crash course in tithing. There's $10. How much do I owe God? I owe a dollar. I, I owe him a dollar. There, done for. That is God's. I think I ought to give an offering as well. So, okay, well, I'll think about that. Let's see. Oh, I think I'd like to give the missions. So I'm going to give that. I'm going to put that in the offering plate or in the envelope, however you do it. I got some more money here. I'm thinking, you know what? Alms. I think I'd like to be a blessing. You know what? I appreciate you. How much of that is God's? 10%. There you go. A dime for those of you keeping track at home. But anyway, that wasn't part of the illustration. But I just, I just appreciate you, buddy. Thank you very much. <laughs> Miss Abria, I appreciate you very much. Thank you for all that you do for the Lord. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mm hmm. You learn about people at church, don't you? You don't have to give alms. That's between you and the Lord. You don't even have to give offerings. That's between you and the Lord. I encourage you to do that. You do owe the tithe. And I think you ought to strive to be giving in offerings and alms. And again, that's just an illustration. That's, and I guess that can just go in the offering because it would look really bad if I took it back. So I guess I'll just leave it there. That's all right. God's been good to me. But what you just witnessed, guys, that should be a regular thing in the life of every Christian. It should not be abnormal when we talk about money unto the Lord. It's a tool. If I talked about using your talent for Jesus, we'd say, amen. You ought to use your schedule and schedule Jesus and do things for him. Amen. You ought to use what God's given you. Use it for his glory. Amen. You ought to use your money unto the Lord. Oh, me. Right? We need to normalize talking about our treasure because it reveals a lot of who we are and it reveals a lot of what we truly are worshiping. Okay, can I encourage you, please don't say things like, you know, I can't afford to tithe. I promise you that's not the issue. You can. Seek God. Seek God to rearrange some things. I mean, do we really need cable TV? Oh, oh, you're telling on yourself, church. No, we don't. I mean, do, do we really need to go out to eat this much and, and go shopping this much? And do we really need that brand new coat after I got a coat last week? No, we don't. I'm telling you, you can tithe. But if you need some help, I encourage you, please seek the Lord. I'm not a financial whiz. And I am not a poster boy for managing money. I will confess, I'm not. But if you seek to honor God, if Jesus has your heart, I promise you, you will start to make changes in accordance of how can I help? What can I do? I want to do things unto Jesus. I, I, I want to help the cause, and I want to get on board, and Lord, just help me with that. Again, I'm certainly not, not the best at, at talking about money, but I do know some biblical principles. Go to work, earn your paycheck, budget your money, give to God, be generous, guard against debt, be content, thankful, always. Put some money in savings, take care of your family. That's basic Bible principles. Uh, I can give you, what I'm saying is I can give you a verse to back up every one of those. But what I, what I see in my personal life is since I have started tithing and giving, God has taken care of me. I will not lie to you and say that every week has just been just, you know, an abundance of blessings. You know, sometimes you feel like you're just scraping by. But we've never gone without. We've never needed anything. We've always had a roof over our head. We've always had shoes. We've always had food. We've always had what we need. We may go without the wants, but we've always had what we need. And is that not a good heavenly father to love us and bless us in spite of us? 
as I said, money can be a touchy subject if you let it be. I don't think it has to be. It seems to me like the ones who get the most upset and uncomfortable, those are the ones who are struggling with it, right? If I preach about soul winning, the ones who don't like it are the ones who don't share the gospel. So I'm not trying to be mean. I'm simply trying to open our eyes about some things God talks about regarding money. And uh, you will find throughout the Bible there's a common theme. God always commends generosity. He commends thanksgiving. And he condemns greed. And he condemns covetousness. Let's go back to our opening text, and I promise I'm about done. Okay? See if you can let go of the pews, right? 2 Corinthians 9. 2 Corinthians 9. We're just going to reread just a few verses, a few closing statements, and then I'm done. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Our opening text. Look in verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. But this I say, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. Right? What you give is what you get. But he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart. That means as the real you, as what's really going on in here. So let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Now look at this. This is one of the best parts. And God is able to make some grace. Hold on, let me try that again. And God is able to make a little bit of grace. Hold on, let me try it one more time. And God is able to make, what's that word? All, All grace. Everything at his disposal is there for you. All grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. So our opening text told us about the blessings of giving. Again, God owns it all anyway. He allowed to let us... Have some. The way I look at it is, man, you're going to let me keep 90% of this? I don't deserve none of that. You're going to let me keep 90%? What? And when he sees us giving and being generous as we ought to, I believe it makes him want to bless us that much more. I believe we've seen enough Bible verses that prove that. And again, he is able to make all grace abound toward you. What does that mean? That means you couldn't give out God if you tried. You could not outgive God if you tried. So, he's a debtor to nobody. So let me encourage you. Learn to love to give. Learn to love to give. Don't be stingy. Don't nickel and dime God to death. Don't just be a taker. Understand that what we do with our money and our time, it reveals a whole lot of what we really are. Be generous. Be generous. Have faith and be cheerful. Please don't growl at the ushers as you put your envelope in there, unless they growl at you first, which, I mean, I suppose I could see that too. But be thankful that you get to invest in a worthy cause and get excited that the word of God promises some of these things, these blessings that come back to us. This ain't just some preacher hoping to, to get some money when everyone goes home. That's not how this is. This is me, like Paul said, fruit that may abound to your account. Just look with your own eyes what God himself promises to the faithful, generous, cheerful giver. Get excited about those promises. Turn your life around by being generous. And as we close, allow me to ask, would you classify as a giver or a taker? Where would you classify it? What, what does your heart say about you right now? Am I a giver or am I a taker? So let's strive to be generous. Let's strive to be faithful in our giving and trusting in God. And this morning, as we go to invitation time, let's just ask God to deal with our hearts regarding this. How's my thanksgiving? How, how's, how is my, my life as far in regards of just allowing my faith in God to be shown with how I'm giving and what I am giving? So let's seek to be a people of thanksgiving. Say, Lord, you've been, you've been so good to me. What can I do in return? Let's ask the Lord to help us. Lord, would you help us this morning as we go into invitation time? Lord, thank you so much for the attentiveness of your people. 
Lord, thank you very much for the wonderful promises in Scripture about our financial giving. Lord, I understand completely it can be a touchy subject. Lord, we don't always like talking about money. But God, I pray that you would help us in regards to what we can do to honor you with our money. Lord, I pray that you deal with us individually, deal with us corporately. Holy Spirit of God, it is now on you. I ask you to speak to every heart, deal with every mind. Help us to give with a cheerful heart as we ought to give as you lead us to. And oh God, would you help us to trust you and have faith in you that you are able to make all grace abound toward us. We will never go wanting. Lord, we will never go needing, rather. Lord, you will take care of us. We trust you. We have faith in you. Please do business with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. If you could, I invite you to stand with me with nobody talking and no, uh, no looking around, eyes closed, heads bowed. As the piano plays, the altar's open if you would like to come and pray. I encourage you, why don't you thank God for what you have today. We are so very blessed. And if you're like me, sometimes you miss out. You, you don't see the, you know, the running water and the electricity and the comfy bed and the clothes and the shoes and all these things we get. What a blessing it is. Please don't overlook your blessings. It is human nature to always want. I want something else. I want something more. What else can I have? But rather, let's try to turn that and say, Lord, what can I give? How can I help? What can I invest in the cause? And be thankful for what you have. Because I promise there's someone else who, they would look at you and they would say, you are one blessed individual. Now our nature would be, well, but I don't have this and I need that and I want that. That's human nature. But I promise you there's someone else out there that is not as fortunate as you, not as blessed as you. They would look at your bad day and they pray for that. God's been so good to us. Let's just take some time. Follow the Lord's prompting. Help us to demonstrate thanksgiving. Amen. God's good, isn't he? Amen. You can be seated. Thank you so much for your attentiveness. Just have a couple of orders of business first. Uh, first thing is uh, Miss Jackie Wildman back there. Miss Jackie, why don't you wave at us? There she is back there. Uh, are you still an Alabama fan? Of course. Of course. All right. <laughs> Roll Tide, right? All right. <laughs> So on that note, uh, Miss, Miss Jackie uh, has made known she would like to unify with us in church membership. Talk to her on Tuesday at the primetime luncheon. She knows the Lord Jesus as her Savior. She's been biblically baptized, and by statement of faith transfer, she'd like to unite with us in church membership. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Told you, Miss Jackie. Even though Alabama fans. Yeah. 
That's how you know the Lord's in it. We, <laughs> amen. So, <laughs> well, hey, are we happy to have our newest member here? Amen. Give her a hand. <clears throat> amen. I want to encourage you to get by, shake your hand after the service, okay? We also have Miss Pamela Wagler here, and uh, Miss Pamela as well would like to join our church by statement of faith transfer. She knows the Lord Jesus as Savior. She's been biblically baptized, and she would like to unite with us in membership. All in favor of wel welcoming Miss Pam into our fellowship, say aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? Amen. Miss Pam, welcome home. Give her a hand. And uh, she has asked to share a brief testimony. So, Miss Pam, why don't you come on up and you do that? She's going to share a testimony with us real quick. Well, I just wanted to give an encouragement testimony on tithing. Um, when I retired August of, um, what is this, 2021, um, I told my husband, I said, I can't live on my retirement, so it's working. <laughs> so this past June, he's been in and out of the hospital three times, and we've been living on my Social Security. And it has been very, 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 very tough. And um, it got to the point that when I was tithing, I knew that check was going to bounce, but I did it anyway. But do you guys know, in a one week's time, we got two checks from the Indiana Department of Revenue. I had no idea we were getting it for $325 apiece. And then I got another two checks from German American Bank, someone did a class action suit against them and we got over $500 from that. So that took me out of the hole for that. So, um, and then um, I had filed an extension on our taxes because um, when I was working, we pretty much had to Pay every, pay every year and with not working and having to pay 2021 taxes I was really scared and so October 17th was the deadline and um, a couple weeks ago when we did the collection for um, the pastor appreciation and everything I tithed and I gave money on that knowing it was going in the hole. And in the meantime, I filed my taxes and I got back the amount that I tithed. Amen. I got a huge refund. Amen. And so I haven't belonged to a church in probably seven, eight years. Um, my kids and I <clears throat> went to Boonville Worship Center from the time they were 12 and um, they got married there and <coughs> all kinds of stuff. So I do some things that was going on um, I didn't agree with everything so we left. But um, I haven't been in church since and it's been a long time and I have missed having a church family until now because the people here are so loving and friendly. And I felt at home the minute I walked in. And I knew this is where I wanted to be. I've never been Baptist before, so don't hold that against me. I've always been Pentecostal. Um, so, and I'm learning the ways. That's why I asked him, you know, when can you give a testimony or anything? But I just wanted you to know, I wanted you to be encouraged to tithe, even when that bank account says negative. Because something, something's going to happen, and God has blessed us crazily, and my husband's back at work full time, and all that kind of stuff. So, just wanted to give you that encouragement. I'm not going to make Brother Francis do it because he's scared to death of talking publicly, but he's got quite a testimony about tithing himself. I encourage you, everyone, all at the same time, just hound him and ask him about it, okay? All right. Well, God's good. It's been good to be in his house, hasn't it? Amen. Amen. Let's close in a word of prayer. 
and we'll be dismissed. I do want to encourage you to come back. Yes, ma'am. calling on God to do what he said he would do. And by the way, anything you read in his book, take it to the bank because he said, or the Bible says he exalts his word above his own name. That's how important he cares the Bible for. So, Amen. Well, shall we close in a word of prayer? <laughs> amen. All right. The restaurants don't open until I give them the okay, by the way. So everyone take a breath, okay? Y'all didn't know that. I have a button I press. That's when the restaurants open, okay? So I, maybe not. I don't know. It's not up here anymore. Let's close in prayer and we'll go. I hope you come back. Choir practice, 4.30, church at 6. Brother Ryan Maglinger, I appreciate you, sir. And uh, a lot of people have commented on that beautiful picture of our church. Not me. It's Brother Ryan using his talents under the Lord. And I'm not going to rob any more blessings from him. Uh, but, uh, and he, by the way, he didn't want attention. But uh, the Lord has blessed us with the Maglinger family. Brother Ryan using the talents of the Lord like that. I'm grateful for that. He's going to close us in a word of prayer. He's also awesome because he prays enough time to get me back to the back door. <laughs> Swig water and get ready to shake everybody's hand. So, amen. Brother Ryan's going to close us in prayer. And when he is done praying, you are dismissed. Thank you all very much for coming.